variety. So that's been my journey since. And I'm going to read a piece to you, as Gail said, one of the books I wrote is a book called Tilly, Story of Hope and Resilience. And this book is loosely based on my life. But before I read this to you, I want to tell you a little bit about the journey of how Tilly came to be. When I first sobered up, I was working in, at the hospital in Kamloops in a psychiatric unit. And I would find that individuals would come in and they'd get medicated and there would be no chance to hear the story, hear why they were brought in, for them to heal. And then they'd get discharged and then they'd be brought in again and they'd get stronger medication. And so I didn't want to be part of that anymore. So I applied to the School of Social Work here at the University of Victoria. And you had to write something called a personal statement. And then if that got accepted, you got invited down for an interview. So my statement was accepted and I got invited down for an interview. And when I came down here and went into that room, there was five women sitting behind a table and I was instantly, I instantly honestly felt like I was gonna throw up because it was very intimidating. And I sat down and went through my interview and kept breathing so I wouldn't pass out of, out of nerves. And at the end of the interview, I stood up and I had my hand on the door and I was about to leave and one of the women said, I look forward to reading your book one day. And I continued to open the door because I didn't think she was talking to me. At that point, I was six months sober and writing a book was so far out of the concept of who I thought I could be. So I opened that door and began to walk out and she said, no, wait, Monique, I'm talking to you. I look forward to reading your book one day. And I got out of that room as fast as I could because what she was saying was so uncomfortable. But what she did was plant the seed and I began to think about that. And it wasn't until about 18 years later that I actually began to write. All those years I kept getting messages and I wasn't listening. And then finally I was in Toronto and I was there for work and I'd gone for a massage. Who's ever in here has ever gone for like a real massage where you're on the table and so a few of you. If you ever have the chance, I encourage you. So when they're massaging your back, you're kind of face down on this table and your face is in what's like a donut. And about halfway through the massage, it was like a Chinook came in the room and it got really warm. And then I could hear the jingles of a jingle dancer. And then this whoosh, 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 almost like an eagle fan. And these ancestors started to pop their heads underneath that table. And they were saying, write the book. Why haven't you written the book? They were perturbed because they'd been giving me all these messages and I wasn't listening. So I left that session starting to think, okay, maybe I need to write. And then the next day I was giving a presentation on our history from an indigenous perspective. And at the end, this man stood up at the back of the room and walked right towards me across the conference floor and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I started to pay attention and I started to write. And I wrote a very first initial draft that I gave to some family members at Christmas, and it looked like this. I just had 10 copies made down here at Island Blueprint and gave it to my family for Christmas, and I thought I was done. But they loved it, and they wanted more. And I was shocked by that. So I kept writing. And I wrote a self-published version called, I'm going to show it to you here, it's called Hope, Faith, and Empathy. And as part of writing that, I got quite sick. I put it on hold again. I got quite sick, and when I went to the doctor, I, they diagnosed me with pneumonia. And 10 days later, I still wasn't well. So I went back to the doctor. They sent me for x-rays again. And that was at 11 in the morning. And at 3 that afternoon, the doctor's office called. And you know in our medical system, if the doctor's office calls and invites you back the same day, then it's not usually celebratory news. And so when we went back that day, my partner came with me. The doctor had found a toony sized tumor in my lung that needed to be removed pretty much right away. And so that happened and they removed half of my upper right lung. And I lied in bed then for three weeks and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And that's how Hope, Faith, and Empathy was finished. So I share that with you because sometimes, as I said, we get messages. They're like pebbles. And if we don't listen to those pebbles, we get rocks. 
And if we don't listen to the rocks, we get boulders. And if we don't listen to the boulders, we get bricks. And if we don't listen to the bricks, the whole brick wall comes down. So for me, that's what happened when I had the surgery. The whole brick wall came down. For some of you sitting here, you might be in a relationship where you're going, this might not work for me anymore. And you keep getting messages and you haven't made the change yet. I encourage you when you, when you get those messages to make the changes before the whole brick wall comes down. Because I tell you, one of the most humbling things in my life was lying in that hospital bed recovering. And as I wrote, it was like something transformed inside of me. And Hope, Faith, and Empathy I was self-published, so it came out, sold 1,500 copies in the first two months, which made it a bestseller in Canada as far as being self-published. I knew none of that, because I, I knew nothing about the publishing industry. I just knew I had to listen to the message of writing. And so I was at a church, I was asked about four years ago to come to a church and talk about reconciliation. Which is interesting when I think about it now, because that was way before the TRC had even come to Victoria, and before our country was really talking about reconciliation. And at the end of the presentation at the church, one of the women said to me, so what's next for you? And I said, well, I'd love to find somebody to distribute hope, faith, and empathy. And she said, well, you know, I have this neighbor who does something with books. And so I gave her a copy. And I said, well, if you happen to run into that neighbor, maybe you could give her a copy. Or him. I didn't know actually at that point it was a, what they were. And so a couple weeks later, I was driving home from our friendship center. And I was listening to CBC. And Joanne Craigie was away. And so it was a gentleman named Gregor Roberts. Some of you will know if you listen to CBC or if your parents do. And he said, so today we have our BC book reviewer on. Nikki Tate. And Nikki, what are you reviewing for us? And she said, oh, I'm reviewing a local author, Moni Gray Smith. And so I was pulling into Thrifties to get groceries as I was listening to this. <laughs> My hands start to shake on the wheels, and I find a parking spot. And this neighbor, who had happened to do something with books, was the BC book reviewer for CBC. So I think that the message for me is that when we follow what we're supposed to be doing, when we use our gifts in the best way possible, magical things happen. So I'm going to read you a little piece from Tilly, right at the very beginning. This is one of the first pieces when Tilly first has her first drink of alcohol, and it's, this chapter is called The Buzz. So Tilly, at this point, is 12, and her and her family, at this point, she's already gone to 11 different schools and her family has moved 17 times. So it gives you a sense about the lack of roots that she had and the lack of connection to people in her life other than her family. So when she comes to this new school, she's almost desperate to make friends. My dad and his siblings did what they had seen their own father do. They drank to celebrate. They drank because it was a hot summer day. They drank because it was a cold winter's night. They drank when the Rough Riders won or the Oilers lost. From time to time, my sister and I, from the time my sister and I were young, we learned that when you were celebrating or when you were hurting, in fact, for pretty much any reason you created, you poured yourself a cold one. Often my dad would let me have a swig of his beer or Auntie Pauline would give me a taste of one of her frou-frou drinks, a Mai Tai or a pina colada. Even though I found the taste of beer disgusting, I never let my dad know that, for fear he, he wouldn't offer again. I felt like his special little girl when he gave me a swig, and I instantly liked the taste of my auntie's drinks. I learned that if I used a straw, I could slip it into her drink and take a long slip, long sip when she wasn't looking. My real attachment to alcohol, though, began in the spring of grade seven, when a couple of girls in my class, Abby and Joe, invited me home for lunch. Come on, Tilly, Abby said. My parents are at work, but they left us something special. As usual, I was finding it hard to make friends. I was tired of eating my fried bologna sandwiches all alone and excited and was excited to be invited. Abby's place was close to our school, and I was surprised to see that her parents had left their alcohol sitting on the kitchen floor. My parents kept theirs in the liquor cabinet above the fridge, and my dad's beer was in the small fridge in the workshop. 
I watched as Abby mixed vodka, orange juice, and 7-Up. On my first sip, my tongue burned, and a warm sensation followed the liquid down to my stomach. The drink tasted so good that I gulped down the whole glass. This is delicious. Sort of like a Shirley Temple, I said to my new friends. It was so convenient. The vodka couldn't smell on our breath, and orange juice and 7-Up were things we always drank. Even better, nothing had prepared me for the tingling in my legs, the buzzing sensation in my head, and the awesome feeling that I could do anything. I loved the feeling the drink created. And that was really the beginning, not only of my own journey, but also for Tilly in this story of a long, long walk of 11 years of using. And so this book that I've written is in a genre called creative nonfiction, which over sort of the last 10 years or so has really become quite popular, even more so over the last five years. And creative nonfiction is a form of writing in which you can really almost do anything with. Tell any stories, weave in your own story, weave in reality, and mix it with what might not be reality. Which is a little bit different than a, um, autobiography, in which is mostly exactly the true events that have occurred from that individual's perspective. So once Hope, Faith, and Empathy came out, and that announcement occurred over CBC, two weeks later I was at my desk working and I had a phone call. And this woman said, Hi Monique, my name is Diane Morris. I'm the publisher of Sodernist Press, and we'd like to publish your book. And my first response was, what book? And she said, well, hope, faith, and empathy, but we'd like to have you do a significant rewrite. And so we did. I worked with an incredible editor. Her name was Barbara Pullen. And we wrote for six months, very, very intensely. And that's how Tilly came about. Tilly, in many ways, is a significantly new book. It has new characters, a new beginning, a new end, new chapters. And we dove in and wrote like crazy. And I'm going to pass around to you because the writing process requires, I think, immense humility, meaning that we must be able to take feedback and criticism and advice and suggestions and be able to sort out what lands with me and what doesn't, which is very much like your lives. You're going to get lots of feedback from people over the years about your behaviors, about your actions, about the way you show up. And you need to figure out what's true for you and what's not. So I'm going to send around, I brought a couple of pages. Because when I received the manuscript back the very first time from Barbara, the editor, it came in this brown manila envelope and I was so excited to open it and see what changes she was recommending. And I opened it, and I could feel my heart go, and my stomach go, because every single page had, and I'm not exaggerating, you'll see this as it comes around, between 10 and 20 either pencil or red marks on it. Every single page, there was 276 pages. So I just put all of those pages right back into the brown envelope and put them in my desk, because it was too much think about how am I going to make all those changes. So I'm going to send these around, maybe one can go Just so you have a sense that when you're reading a book, that book has also been on a journey and has required incredible editing time over time over time. When it comes, you'll see all the pencil marks, the red marks, all the required changes and requests for changes. And again, in so many ways, this is like our lives. Right? We get asked to make changes all the time. Some of you today, you were going somewhere else and then all of a sudden you're sitting here. Some of you will naturally be inclined to make changes and they'll be okay and some of you will be like, a change totally disrupts your whole day. But it's part of life, change. 
or some of you might say unfortunately. So just as those pages go around, I'm going to read one more, one more piece for you from about Tilly. And this is when she's going into grade eight and getting ready to go to the school at the end of summer vacation to see who she'll have for a home room. And then the connection that she ends up having with her teacher. On the last day of summer vacation, Abby's older sister Anna suggested we go over to the high school to see if they had posted the homeroom lists yet. Anna was the expert we consulted on school and all things of teenage life. Oh no, you have Mrs. Murphy for homeroom. The horror on Anna's face frightened me. Who was this Mrs. Murphy? And why was she to be feared? Grade eight, in the end, wasn't all that scary after all, and neither was Mrs. Murphy. She wasn't a popular teacher, but that was because she expected the best from us and didn't tolerate any antics in her classroom. Once I got to know her, I actually thought she was kind of funny. During our first week of school, Mrs. Murphy introduced us to Harry, a small goldfish who lived in a bowl at the back of the room. Each of us would take our weekly turn to feeding Harry. She informed us that his life was in our hands. She'd had more than one goldfish go belly up in her ears. As a teacher, she said she made it clear she didn't want Harry added to that list. The first month of high school turned out better than I could have imagined. I joined the field hockey team and instantly loved the sport. Abby, Joe, and I had the same lunch break on Tuesdays and th Fridays, which was perfect. I didn't have field hockey those days, so I was free to drink my cocktails at lunch. I didn't get my turn to care for Harry until just before Christmas, and I noticed that he was in a bigger bowl, a much bigger one. When we came back from Christmas holidays, he was in an even larger bowl. And after spring break, we returned to find Harry in an aquarium. All of us had noticed the changes in the size of Harry's bowls until Mrs. Murphy, pardon me, but until Mrs. Murphy pointed it out. Few of us had noticed that Harry himself had grown. After all, we were in grade eight and too busy noticing each other. But what she told us was very interesting to me. Goldfish grew as big as their environment would allow. When Mrs. Murphy asked us to take a good look at Harry, we hooed and awed as if we were seeing him for the first time. He's way bigger, said one classmate. He must have taken roids over the break, said one of the jocks. Mrs. Murphy laughed. Actually, Harry didn't take steroids over spring break. Instead, every time I moved him to a bigger bowl, he grew. And each of us was exactly like Harry, she said. We grow to whatever size of goal for goal we allowed ourselves to create. The more risks you consciously take to grow and learn, to try new things and have new experiences, the bigger your goldfish bowl will become, she said. I didn't really know what she was talking about. But a thrill of anticipation pulsed through my body. I knew I'd have to ask her what she meant by consciously, but not today and not in front of the class. Mrs. Murphy was actually my homeroom teacher for grade 8, and then she was my English teacher for grade 10. And I learned so much from her. But one of those things was about Harry and our goldfish bowl, and that the more we step out and try things and do things that aren't comfortable, the more risks we take in trying, going new places, meeting new people, the bigger our goldfish bowl will be. So that when it's time to take on big risks, we're familiar with doing that. So I'm just wondering at this point, I'm going to share a couple more things, but just want to open the floor at this point and see if there's any questions or comments yet. Please. Oh, yes, thank you. So this book here is called My Heart Fills with Happiness, and it's a children's board book that I wrote um, out of respect for the survivors of re Indian residential schools and their families. And it, it was inspired as I was teaching a class at an Aboriginal Head Start, which are our cultural preschools. And at lunch, it was mostly with the parents and grandparents, and at lunch the children came in. And I saw uh, this cook come take her grandson's hand in, his, in her, uh, pardon me, take his face in her hands. 
and his whole body changed. And what I saw was how she looked at him was his heart filled with happiness. And it got me thinking about what fills my heart with happiness and what fills children's hearts with happiness. And how did the legacy of residential schools impact that? So that's how this book comes about. It gives examples for children around what fills their hearts with happiness. Things like when I, when I smell bannock baking in the oven. When I sing. All the examples are things that don't cost any money and there's no square machines in this either. And the illustrator is a woman named Julie Flett. She's Cree Métis, and she's uh, an incredible award-winning illustrator. And we worked together on this. I was just telling Gail when we came in that often when you write a children's book, if your manuscript is what they say bought, then the publisher chooses who will be the illustrator. And often, as the author, you don't see the book until it's either in its final stages or it's come out which is kind of weird when you think about it. You've written these words, somebody else is drawing images, but how do you ensure that they've captured the intent that the words have? I have another children's book coming out in the fall and it's called You Hold Me Up. And it's for children from three to five and it's rooted in reconciliation. And they chose a different author or a different illustrator for the book and so I asked if I could see the illustrations when they first came in. And it was like, well, we don't usually do that. And I said, yes, but we're talking about a book that's about reconciliation. And so we as a country are trying to find different ways to do things. And so maybe we could actually role model that in how we create this book. And that was really hard for me to ask that, to stand up for myself. And I'm so grateful I did because the publisher had missed sending to the illustrator a really key piece of information. And that was that the book was to be child to child. All the illustrations, the intent was for children to see themselves with other children in the book. And what the illustrator first sent back were all illustrations of parent to child or adult to child. So had we not had this process, the whole intent would have been lost in the book. So I saw the second round of illustrations a couple days ago, and wow, they're beautiful. So I'm really looking forward to seeing when, and those illustrations are only in pencil. So I'm looking forward to seeing when she puts color to them. So thank you for that. Please. What helped you quit drinking? Oh, it helped me quit drinking. Ah. Well, there was one specific event where I took my mom, I was working in Vancouver, and I took my mom to a hockey game, Vancouver Canucks against the Los Angeles Kings. And at that time, a gentleman named Wayne Gretzky, some of you will know of him, was playing. And my mom is a huge sports fan. She was devastated last night after the Jays lost. So she's a huge sports fan. So this was a big deal. She loved Wayne Gretzky. So we'd gone to this game, and I had started to drink before we went to the game. And then I drank throughout the game, and I passed out about a quarter of the way through the third period in my seat. And I woke up to her tugging on my ear really hard. Let's get out of here. She was so mad at me. And I just kind of sheepishly stumbled and followed her out. And the next morning when I woke up, the front page of the province was that Wayne Gretzky had gotten a natural hat trick in the third period after we'd left which means he scored three goals in one period. And my mom was even madder. But for me, what happened was my incredible remorse that because of my actions, she didn't get to see something that would have been like a dream for her. And so that was a key change for me. And what it required of me then to do was I was working and I went home to Kamloops and I started to see an alcohol and drug counselor. And the first couple of times when I said I was going to stop, I didn't stop. I didn't have the ability yet. I can remember even one day sitting at a pub with a friend and we were having beers and I said to her, guess where I was last night? She's like, oh, where were you? And I said, oh, I was at an AA meeting. And then we're like, cheers, because I wasn't ready yet. And then one day I was driving with a friend and I was talking to her and she said, it sounds like you think you have a problem with alcohol pulled over to the side of the highway. 
and I just started to talk and I started to weep. And she took me again to an AA meeting the next night. And I wasn't going to go in. This is sort of in Tilly's case. I wasn't going to go in. And we're sitting in her car, and I saw in the rearview mirror this man walk by. And he had on faded Levi's and cowboy boots and a jean jacket with the collar up, black curly hair, and he was incredibly handsome. And he sort of sauntered. And I saw him go into the basement of the church where the AA meeting was, and I said to her, well, if they look like that in there, it can't be that bad. And we went in. And he and I ended up in a relationship. But it took people in my life to help take me by the hand and say, there's something going on. How can I help you? And then it took courage inside to change. Because when I stopped drinking, I was 22. And what was so common at that age was to go out and party. Things, I think, have shifted a lot. But at that age, that's mostly what we did. And so I had to find new ways. I had to find new friends. I had to find other things that felt good. And then I went to treatment a year and a half later to a place called Round Lake, which is up in the Okanagan Territory, just outside of Vernon. And their motto is, culture is treatment. And what's fascinating is the lake that the, the center is on is actually fully round. And they've never been able to find the bottom of it. And there's no tributary that leads into it. It really is a lake of medicine. And in my last week there, we had medicine men come from the Dakotas. And they did a UEP ceremony, which is a name giving and a healing ceremony. And this morning when I introduced myself, I said, my name is Misty Kwashiko, which when translated means little drum. And when they gave me that name, they said, we give you this name not because of your stature, being like a walking five foot one. They said, but we give you this name because it goes back nine generations on your dad's side and seven generations on your mom's. And it re part of your life's work is to remind people of their heartbeat. That if you think about when children are in utero, when you were in your mom's tummy, the first sound we actually hear is her heartbeat, which is that double beat, just like the drum. And they said, that's why we've given you this name, is to remind people of their heartbeat. And they said, and you know, in life, we don't have to be a big drum to make a big difference. They said, if you, bless you, if you drop a small pebble in a pond, that ripple goes and goes and goes. But if you drop a big boulder, sometimes there is no ripple. The splash is just so big and kind of reverberates in different ways. So that would be the other piece for me was treatment, was significantly different, uh, altered me. But I grew up in a home where there was a great deal of internalized racism, where neither of my parents were proud to be indigenous, and we grew up knowing very little about our culture, witnessing extreme racism towards my mom because of her skin coloring and her lack of formal education. She has grade four. And so I grew up without roots. And when I went to treatment, that's what happened, was I felt like I began to put roots into the earth. And so before that, when the wind would blow or something in life would happen, I'd just get tossed around like a sagebrush. But after going to treatment and having those deep roots rooted, when I get knocked over by life and it still happens, at least now I've got those roots to keep me. I don't get blown all over the place. So I would say to answer your question, not through story, but just in straight ways, it was the love of friends and family, a courage to make change, and a knowingness, honestly, that if I didn't make change, that I would die. That either I'd be killed drunk driving, or I would take my own life. And then the fourth thing was learning about my culture and beginning to learn my language were significant aspects to my healing and that allow me to still stand here today. So thank you. That's a very poignant question. Thank you. Any others at this time? Please. Yes, my mother is still living. Whether 
So your change might say that it's a little bit more of a fun. You can't go back to the That obviously is kind of What kind of discussion did you have over that in your society? Thank you. We've had many discussions, and when, I'm, when you're at Round Lake on the last day of treatment, you do something called marbling out. And somebody important in your life gives you, you make a marble through beating, and then somebody important in your life puts that on you as you transition out of marble, out of Round Lake. And so it was my mom who I asked to come up. And part of that journey was having those discussions with her, and that was only one example. I have many, unfortunately, many stories like that. And so that was part of our healing. But I can remember still, this was the level of her internalized racism. racism. And this is you know, now 22 years ago. So she's made huge change. But I can remember one day coming home from treatment and I, was, I had picked her up at her house and I was in my car and I had powwow music on. And I remember her getting into my car and saying, how Indian are you trying to be? Because of that level of internalized racism that she had. And I said, well, I just love this music. And I'm actually not trying to be anything. And I could feel in the car, she just kind of softened. Because had I reacted, you know, in life, when we react at somebody, and they get their guard up, and then they want to react also. But if we can respond often with love and kindness and tenderness and honesty, then it softens things. And so we still have lots of conversations, without question, for sure. Thank you. Please. In your book, Chile, um, you have a grandmother, Chile, who is an important man to teach you in an indigenous way. So I'm just wondering if um, you can speak about that character. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The question was in Tilly, one of the key characters is the grandma, and her name is Grandma Tilly, so Tilly's named after her. I'll actually read a piece that gives you a sense about the relationship Tilly has with her grandma. So this is near the very beginning of the book, uh, when Tilly's 11, and gives you a sense about the relationship when grandma's visiting, and also when grandma goes home to her community. So just to put a piece in context here, if you think about the 1960s, 70s, even the 80s in some communities, what did a party line mean? Anybody know what a party line was? Might have a very different context for what you would please. Okay, thank you. So it was one line that often came into a community that joined different houses, sometimes even different neighborhoods. And so you could be on a phone call and have somebody else pick up. And if they picked up in the old days with the receiver slowly lifted that button and held the phone, they could listen to the whole conversation and you wouldn't even know they were there. In some ways, it was the first form, I think, of social media. And for those people in the community who loved to know what was going on, it was like this beautiful thing, right? Party lines. So that's the context of party line in this beginning piece. During her visits, Grandma Tilly taught me about being generous about telling the truth and always treating other people with dignity and respect. Every night after dinner, she and I would sit outside and she'd pull out her pipe bag and load her pipe for her evening smoke. Come here, little Tilly. Gather under my wing and let's talk about the day. With me tucked up close to her, we'd review our escapades and she'd ask me, what did you learn today and what was the best part? I missed her so much when she'd gone home. But Grandma Tilly made a point of staying in touch by phoning. She was on a party line in her community, and it was common to be on a phone call and have someone cut in. Who's on the line? A person would ask. It's Tilly, and I'm on with little Tilly, and we're going to be a while. Once when I called her to talk about some things I was upset about at school, she told me, what you've got to remember, Tilly, is that everyone's born with love in their hearts. Sometimes life takes that away, but we're all born with it. So whenever you enter a room, in your imagination, fill it with love and make enough room for everyone else to fill the room with love too. That, my girl, is when good things happen. I always felt better after my talks with Grandma Tilly. Her teachings, words, and sayings were like medicine to me. And Grandma Tilly shows up all the way through. She passes not long after that scene in a chapter that's called Losing My Anchor. 
which was one of the catalysts for Tilly to begin to drink also when we lose, when she loses that really important, significant person. But that piece also reminds us about treating each other with dignity and respect. And that it's like the teaching of the drum, that what goes out comes back. And so I encourage you to be very mindful of the words that you use, the actions you take, because at some point they always come back. It may not be from the same person, it can be a totally different situation, it might be 10 or 12 or 15 years later, but they always come back. When I look back at high school, I can see the young people who were so mean, like really not kind people. And I know now that there must have been the same hurt in their home in some way. But those people today, not all of them are alive. But those unkind people from, from those years are very lonely. And many of them in high school were the popular kids, which always bobbled bob my mind was how, how can people be who are so unkind be the most popular? So I really encourage you to be as kind as you can be and to be as respectful and hold everyone up with dignity. I'm working on what well, I actually just sent off to a publisher, the sequel to Tilly, and it's called Tilly and the Elders. And it is about Tilly, she gets called by seven elders to go on a road trip from Vancouver to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And they want to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico because they want to go to the World Pow Wow. So it's the adventures that the elders and Tilly get in along the way. They have three days in Las Vegas, they have a couple days in Sedona, and then what happens when they're in Albuquerque at the Pow Wow. Because if you think about our history and that for these elders, Many of you will know that our ceremonies were, became illegal in 1885 and they weren't legal again until 1951. So even acknowledging the territory would have been illegal at that time, perhaps even for us to gather in this way. Our ceremonies were underground so that we can have them today. So in this story, for the elders to go to this powwow is transformative for many of them. Even though they've been to powwows in their community, the world powwow on, on uh, Friday night, often there's 2,500 dancers that come into the arena. And the colors, I went with my mom and my aunt to my daughter a few years ago, the colors and the energy on that floor is so amazing. And on the Friday night that we were there, there was 20,000 people watching. So you think about how when we think that our ceremonies have only been legal for 65 years, how powerfully they've come back. And when we have books that talk about our resilience and our history through a strength-based perspective, we begin to understand the resilience of our people, meaning the ability to bounce back in the face of hardship. That when we look at a lot of the legislation that has occurred in our country, including residential schools, the Indian Act, many forms of legislation were to eradicate us as indigenous people in this country. And not only did that not happen because there's many of us sitting in this room, but we're also the fastest growing population